Hello guys, I'm Vitor Luke Koresma. Hi, from Australia. This is Rick Gadley. This is Katie. And Barry. Hey everyone, this is Austin. And you are watching. And you are watching. And you are watching. Discus Review. Discus Review. Discus Review. Hi everyone, welcome to Discus Review. I'm your host, Pete Circle. We have a very special event tonight. We're with my good friends, Lars and his wife, Lean, and uh, they're in Norway. Lars, Lars, specifically, where are you in Norway? We are in the south part of Norway, just uh, outside Oslo, the main capital. Um, yeah, and six hours from you in New York with the uh, flight. You are six hours ahead. It's, I'm recording this at 3 p.m. Eastern and you're at nine, nine o'clock. Yes. And yeah. uh, Lean, thank you so much for inviting us into your home. We're gonna look at a planted aquarium tonight and we're going to look at an 880 gallon aquarium. But you are mostly in charge of the planted aquarium. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Hmm. That, is I that like to have a green tank. <laughs> green tank, yes. Yeah. And how long have you been working on this tank? I think it's been running for about two, two years. years now. Yeah, two years. Yeah, and I've done some changes along the road. Of course, it, it's always evolving, isn't it? Yeah. Is it a lot of maintenance? I usually spend an hour or two during the weekend. But uh, I like to automize things, so I have uh, automatic water change every day. Okay. About 10 to 15 percent. Yes. And I do fertilizers automatically. And uh, the UV goes on and off automatically when I want it to. And the light, of course. Wow. And you're controlling all of this from your phone? Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I can't. We're going to look. take a look at that in a little bit. Lars, I wanted to ask you, before we start looking at the tanks, I want everybody that's watching to know that your tanks and your living room are basically on the second floor of your home. Isn't that right? Yes, that's right. Second floor. <laughs> and I'm just going to guess you have an 880 gallon tank with a fish room behind. I'm going to ballpark and you tell me how close I am that it's got to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 pounds. What do you think? I think so. And uh, when we um, start planning the house, the constructors made it twice as much so it could carry with steel beams, with uh, double wooden beams, uh, concrete floor, tails, everything. So, so it's made for heavy stuff. <laughs> and how long, how long are you in the house for? Uh, how long we stayed? Oh, Two well, years. Long, when did you build the house? Uh, in 2019, the summer. We took off uh, Lena's old house and build, rebuild a new home on it. It's a lovely home. I've seen pictures and you, of course, we, you and I have done video calls and it's just a, such a lovely home. But you built the home with, with this in mind, that you were going to have the fish tanks. Yeah, I think they thought we were a little bit nuts <laughs> <laughs> when they saw we would have plumbing in the living room and tiles on all, all floors and uh, I don't know the English word for this, but uh, you know, in the, um, in the bathroom, you have this uh, to make things water secure under the tiles. Membrane. Membrane, yes. yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, so all of the second floor is uh, waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> so if there was a flood, uh, it wouldn't damage anything. It would just be the water oh. cleanup. It would be the water and uh, the stairs. maybe the stairs, but not uh, nothing else. Okay. Uh, but don't so, you, it. <laughs> so you really planned the house quite a bit around around the fish tanks, so to speak. What, is that true? Yeah, that's yes. true. And uh, also when we were thinking about, we have large windows here, but we didn't uh, apply the large windows without thinking where to place the tanks. Sure. <laughs> we are that nuts. <laughs> ah, you're into your hobby. It's wonderful. And when everybody it's, uh, sees it, it's I think beautiful. it's a good thing that we share this hobby, even if we do different things. Yes. Maybe the plants and yours with breathing the discus, but it's yeah. a lot of water anyway. Yes, so. <laughs> it really is. And, and we tried 
uh, planning this house, we didn't use an, another architect, so we made it ourselves and try to put it so it looks great and we can enjoy it from the sofa, from the place we are. Because mostly you use the basement, have a lot of aquariums. Yes. And we just want to have it in the main room where we are all the time. Mm. Yes. So uh, that was the plan and we made it come true. <laughs> it's, it's great to see somebody make their dreams come true. I think it's absolutely wonderful. I'm so excited to get the, the tour of this uh, and show everybody. Lean, can we start with you? Can we take a look at your planted aquarium and would you tell us about your filtration and how you set it up? Yeah, I can just uh, take the camera with me. Yep. Like this. Mm, is it possible to see? It's a kind. Of, it's kind of difficult this filming. That is a beautiful aquarium. How many gallons would that be? Oh, I can take it in liter. Uh, it's about six hundred liters yeah. and about hundred liters in uh, in a sump. Yeah, hundred and sixty yeah. gallons. Oh, one sixty. Okay, one hundred sixty gallons. Mm -hmm. For our American friends, and, and we have actually we have a few members in Norway. Um, yes, a lot of Europeans yeah, yeah. that are you watching this, so it's wonderful. So we basically have a hundred sixty gallon tank, and it sounds like it's about an eighty gallon sump, right? Yeah. Yes. Hundred liters. Mm. Uh, no, twenty five. Mm. Yeah. And and did they did you buy the tank uh, all set up like that, or is that a custom stand? Uh, no, this is a custom. No, it's a that's it's a, a standard tank with a um, furniture. Uh, are, so, do you uh, find where yeah. you live in in Norway? Are things difficult to get aquarium supplies or any of that kind of stuff? No, I just think it's a different um, kind of labels. Okay. Uh, this is a Danish label. It's uh, Aquastabil. But uh, I don't know how to say it in, in English. Juve. Juve. It's also very common in Norway. Okay. I'm not quite sure if it's common in, uh, in your country. That's German. Yes. Right. Uh, but it's not difficult. It's beautiful. It's, it looks very balanced and very peaceful. Lean, can you tell us about how many fish do you have in there? Oh, uh, I haven't counted the... It's most of the diamond tetras. I can try to move closer and I can have a look at them. They're, they're great. They, they just... Yeah, I love them. They are really beautiful. I think maybe there's 40 or 50 of them. Yes. They are breathing in there. So... I don't know if we can see uh, one of the fries, but from time to time we see a small one in here. I guess there's just so many hiding spots that some of them survive. And and beautifully uh, beautifully laid out. I see. A, is that a pleco cave to the right? Mm, yeah. I also have um, ancestors uh, bristle nose. Uh, yeah. I think you call them lem yellow lemon bristle nose or something. I see one right there. It's in the shot. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was looking right at them. I'm stir by Corey's, of course. Uh, the stir, yeah, the stir by, but uh, no, I, I can't see the bristle nose. If you can see them, that's good. <laughs> I can see them. He's, he's straight ahead on the, uh, on the yeah, driftwood. Yeah, there. There's a small one. Yeah. Okay. They're also breathing in here. So uh, sometimes I rescue. Um, a couple of them from the caves before they leave the cave and I put them in a different tank where more of them survive. Okay. And this how many discus has, uh, are in there? Uh, I only have two discus. I have had a group in here for uh, seven or eight discus, but then a couple of them paired up and there was a lot of rivalry about uh, they were territorial and uh, a lot of quarrel and fighting. So we remove the couple, and uh, that couple is actually the parents of. Uh, are they the parents of these two, or? And now this is second generation yeah. lines, pure live line. Mm. Yeah. So the um, that's for, that was the couple that are the parents of the ones in uh, the eight hundred and eighty girls. That's yes. right. Yeah. Mm. They, they are beautiful. Now, Lean, what 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 kind of discus are these? Can you move? There you go. 
Sorry, what did you say, Pete? What, what kind of discus are these? Uh, these are F2s. Yeah, second generation of vines, and of our own breed. Yeah. And is the one on the one on the left looks like a is that a, a red solid? Yeah, so one solid and one semi royal. Semi royal, yeah. yeah. They are beautiful. I, I'm going to guess that that's the female on the left. Yeah, I'm actually not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which of them is female or not? Because this this is not a breeding couple. No, but we haven't uh, seen them breeding yet. So uh, they are just going um, going very well along. So they, so um, what I was going to say was that uh, I actually reduced my group of uh, eight, and uh, when removing the couple, we had um, a stable uh, group for a little while, and then there was. Um, one of them getting bullied and I removed that one. That's kind of classic. And in, uh, in the end, I ended up with two. I know that uh, many people says that's the wrong way to keep discus. They should be in a group and I do agree. But uh, in this tank, for some reason, I, it seems to go very well with two. And since Lars are breathing discus, I can have uh, the luxury of choosing two that goes very well along. And as long as I see they are active, they are eating, I don't personally see any wrong in doing that. I think it's wonderful. I, I like it that you have, it's basically that whole tank was designed for these two beautiful fish. And of course, um, I have very, much plants and other fish and of course if I would purely have discus in there I would have to remove a lot of uh, the green and the other fish to just to make space for a larger group. I might actually do that but that's later. <laughs> is, is there any competition for food when you go to feed? Did all the little ones come up for the food first? Uh, when I feed I usually uh, feed something for the diamond tetras and the rainbows in uh, one part of the tank and then I feed uh, for the discus in another part of the tank so that they are able to reach the food, all of them, before it's empty. And, and that sounds like a very simple solution yet so effective. Yeah, and it's functioning now but uh, I had some Congo tetras earlier and with them I wasn't able to manage that at all. They were too quick. If I dropped food over all of the tank, there was nothing left for those discus anyway. So they had to move. <laughs> so I got, got the diamond tetras instead. Very nice. Uh, it's, always a, it's always an experiment, isn't it? You're always trying to figure out yeah. what's best. And I think it's got a lot to do with the temper of uh, both of the discus and the other fishes. And just to clarify for all our viewers, Lars mentioned that these are F2 Discus, which means that's the second generation from wild, from wild right mm. out of the river. That's right. Uh, can we take a look at your fil filtration and what you have going on down there? It's, um, I, yeah. know, I know it's uh, cutting edge. Mm, there, I got the doors opened. We do hold them now, Shep. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I'm just trying to see in that little uh, screen where I'm filming. <laughs> okay, there's my son. And uh, in the first chamber, uh, there's a filter rod and a uh, filter sock catching the first dirty water <laughs> coming down. I usually change in everything in there at least once a week or more often if I need to. The rest of that is just not too often. Uh, it's, not, it's not often I change or wash anything in these other chambers. Of course, all and, the biological uh, media is fine by itself for a long time. Is that right? Yeah, that's best to leave it alone, actually. Um, and if you see the bottles down there with the tubes in. I do. Yeah. That's my fertilizers. And uh, it's really difficult to uh, aim correctly with this. <laughs> you, can, you can just back up a little bit. I'm sure we can get a, yeah. yeah. Oh, there. I see that unit, yes. 
Yes, so there is this uh, automatic uh, fertilizer doser. Uh, I love that because uh, usually I have the lights on the tank just for an hour or so in the morning so that I can see that everything is okay while having breakfast and brushing my teeth and all that. And uh, then the lights is off during the day and the UV is on. And um, just before uh, the light goes on in the afternoon, the UV turns off and uh, when sunrise starts, the fertilizers are dosed into the tank so that when there is full light, all the plants are, uh, the fertilizers are ready in the water for the plants. So you're planting and the lights fertilized go, every day? Yeah, I split the dose into seven. Nice. And that's also because of the, the UV, because um, uh, the UV can take some effect of the iron fertilizer, the ferro. Right. So, um, and I think it's more efficient to, as long as I can dose every day, uh, it will be a, an even and well, um, yeah even dose every day with fertilizer. And that's also because I do water change every day. Right, because you have a drip system. Hmm. Yeah. Can, where where so, is your UV light positioned? Uh, that's behind the tank. Okay. I will take you for a walk again. I just hidden it behind that plant. I don't oh. think maybe you, you can't even see it. It's on the floor behind that uh, big black. Yeah, I, I, I can see the unit and then the uh, hose mm. is going to it, yes. Mm. And it's turned off now because now it's light time. So when the light goes off in uh, the evening, the UV goes on. Perfect. So that uh, it won't affect the fertilizers during light time for the tank. And how did you set up an automatic drip system here? I, I, it doesn't look like it's easily accessible to water. Uh, how I set up what? Sorry. The, the automatic drip system. Uh, oh, I guess I need Lars to explain how this automatic water change is. It's not a drip system. It's uh, um, a magnet turning right. the water on and off for yes. a set uh, amount of minutes. So we have just calculated how many minutes the water should be on to change 15% during the day. So it's actually on for 15 minutes and that will change 15% of the tank volume. So water is coming in at the same time that it's being drained out. Yeah, yeah I yes. think Lars, Lars can explain the plumbing. Yes. <laughs> I will do because I built the same system in the, the breathing room, so I can go through it there. Okay, oh, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. I look forward to seeing more of that. This is an absolutely lovely tank, and you can see it from both sides. We have three sides exposed. Um, yeah. Is the intake for your filtration system, is it at the end? Yeah, it's at the end of the uh, tank here. Yeah. I don't know if you can see it there, but that's the, that's the plumbing going down to the sump. And I have, I think I'll just walk over to the other side of the tank again. Because hidden in, behind another plant, uh, I have a lot of uh, mess. <laughs> uh, there's the water tap and a lot of uh, electronics. It's very, just hidden behind the Tank. Very well hidden. It's very tasteful. So if, did I see that correctly? Is that a pump that's drawing water out of the tank and down into the sump? Uh, what did you think about that? What did you see? Uh, oh. Was there a pump inside the tank? No, there's no pump inside the tank. The pump is uh, down here in the, in the sump. Okay. Mm. Okay, so, that so uh, I, I the pump cool. is uh, pumping the water up into the tank, and uh, there's an overflow um, overflow with water going down to the so drain. Yeah. Mm. And and Lean, talk talk to us for a second about. Uh, I just recently learned from Lars 
that your tap water is naturally about 6.5 pH and very, very low TDS. I think below 50, is that right? Uh, when we take the water from the tap, it's about seven, seven something in the pH. And when it's uh, entered into our systems, it's uh, like 6.8 or 6.7 uh, without that we have to do anything about it. It just turns into that level in the pH, probably because of the plants and the roots and yeah. Do you so have uh, we are very lucky with the water. We don't have to do anything with it. That's wonderful. Also, You're so lucky hmm. to have such healthy water. Yeah, we are very lucky with the water. So uh, unless we wanted to have Malawi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a good thing we don't have Malawi. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. It's such a treat. That, those plants look so healthy and strong. They must be, you must have to trim them back occasionally. They grow so fast. I had uh, a lot more of uh, fast growing plants earlier, but that was too much maintenance. And uh, I have a lot of plants, but they're mainly easy plants, all of them. So they're not very demanding and I don't run any CO2. Uh, it's just um, the fertilizer and uh, yeah, some trimming and cleaning off the glass every weekend. And sometimes I just forget the time and I start working in there and I can easily spend an hour or two there. But I like it. So that's okay. It's a labor of love. Yeah, it is actually. Mm. Thank you so much for showing us that. I, this is one of my favorite planted aquariums that I've ever seen. You have achieved such great balance and grace in this tank. It's beautiful. Thank you. I okay, really Lars. Mm. Lars, are you going to show us the monster? Uh, yes. Um, when we uh, met Lin and me, I had my old house with pretty much the same facilities. And she was thinking he would never move from that house <laughs> until we planned this. And uh, I said that fishes are very important for me and I enjoy yeah, playing with volume, make a piece of nature. And if I could do that, we could build the house together. And we did. Yeah. But it's a good thing that we met in the aquarium club. That, yeah. That's the trick. <laughs> that's, that's such a wonderful way to meet. You, you both have something that you're passionate about, something in common. And that's a great way to build a relationship. Yes. No, it really is. And but, uh, this has been work. Yes, for four months now. So after we moved in here, it was an open hole. And I planned and I used over a year building it. Because it's besides work. We work both for the time. So in weekends, I was doing concrete work. And you saw the picture of the glasses. We lifted up to the second floor. It's heavy. <laughs> yes. And yes, yeah, so I pretty much I did everything with my own hands. I saw pictures of the glass that was lifted up by a crane or some sort of a, a big machine. Uh, yes. On the second floor of your house on the outside. And then I would imagine that it took how many people to pick up the panels and bring them in? Uh, it took one by one glass and it was three grown-ups carrying one by one. The front glass is uh, 19 millimeters, OptiWhite, and the glasses uh, in back and sides are only 10 millimeters, but they are connected into the concrete, so it's strong. Very strong. And you have glass on the bottom as well, yes? Yes, on the bottom as That's well. That's wonderful. Lars, can you yeah. back up and give everybody a a view of what you and Lean see every day when you sit on your couch, you get to look at this. And by the way, guys, if we haven't mentioned, uh, and I, you may have met, heard me mention many times, but this is an 880 gallon tank that Lars and Lean built in for their living room. And this is better than TV. Look what they get to see every single day. Absolutely spectacular. Lars, I think 
I think uh, now you, we're friends and we've been, uh, you know, talking about this tank and you've been showing me all along the way, but I think there's more driftwood in there. Is there, do you, have you added more driftwood? Uh, no, it's uh, the same because I had to put inside the driftwood before I glued the front glass. They are so big. <laughs> oh, that's so right. So they will stay there forever. So I, yeah, maybe one little one because it's actually three roots, three big, big roots and two small ones to fill in. Did you have to prepare the driftwood in any special way before you filled it with water? Uh, no, I steamed it and washed it by a power wash. No chemicals, no nothing, just clean water. This tank is filled up with wild discus. Are they, are they wild F1 or F2? No, this is lines from wilds. So it's actually a cross between F1, first generation, and a brown domestic fish. The madam. The madam oh, of yes. Lina, yes. <laughs> so right. this is actually a crossbreed. When we go into the breeding room, it's pure line, second ge generation as well. And, and how many discus are in this 880 gallon tank? Uh, it's uh, 25 brother and sisters. And mm -hmm. the mother of them. Wow. Absolutely beautiful. In addition to the discus, uh, are there any other uh, discus related or are any other fish in there? Yeah, it's a uh, star by around 18. And it's uh, Hype and Sisters number 066. It's 15 of them. They are around four or five inches, black with patterns. And in three months, I will put in uh, my geos, the Sveni, yeah. You just, Not you just got this a few weeks ago, right? Yeah, do you see that? I yeah. do, I do, I see them working the drifter. Are they very good at cleaning the tank? No. No. <laughs> You're messing up. <laughs> they clean the wood, if you see her, on the bottom. That's from eating wood. Oh, okay. So they're making a mess. Yeah, yeah they are making a mess. So we hope the geos will fix it. Yeah. <laughs> really? Do you do mess around in the sand so that the pump will get it easier. But okay. uh, I have one idea. It's 25. Now you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If uh, Lina takes the camera, I can feed them and you can see. Oh, that's wonderful. Packing food. Mm. Do you want that? Sure, that would be great. I would love to see the meat. I can sit in the coach and we can have a look at the view. That's beautiful, yes. Oh yeah, this, so this is good. We're gonna see the view from your couch. Yeah, I guess I'll just have to sit down where I usually sit because then I can see this tank. Oh, there we go, look at that. My head around and I can see that tank. Oh, beautiful. So uh, this is my favorite spot. Aquarium heaven. Absolutely. I think we will just go a little bit closer to, uh, yeah, you are giving them- um, Frozen uh, brine shrimps. Yeah. yeah. Okay, frozen brine shrimps gonna go in. Now Lars is gonna have to go in that door to the right. And that's yeah. how he's gonna access the back of the uh, tank, which we're gonna see in a little bit. And we'll yeah. have to watch for this frozen brine shrimp to drop into the tank. Is that it? Oh. Yeah. They know it's coming. They are. Hmm. They're a little bit shy. I don't know. Maybe they know they're being filmed. That's very <laughs> possible. My, my fish get very... Uh, they get very shy when I bring a camera close to the tank. Yeah, and actually I go, I am um, carrying this black um, uh, computer and they don't really like if I wear black clothes or if we have uh, strangers visiting wearing dark clothes, they don't like that. So I think maybe just that I'm uh, carrying this um, black computer and pointing at them, that might 
Make or back, you can back up a little bit and give them a little, little room. Hmm. Lean, do you think the discus and the quarries and the plecos are going to breed in this tank since they have so much room and hiding spots? Yeah, I guess they will. But the question is if uh, any of them will survive. Really? I okay. guess uh, the clever one will stay in the back behind the roots and some of them will survive, but uh, some will also get eaten. Sure. Same way as in the planted tank. Hmm. The smartest survive. Yes. <laughs> they hide and survive. It's not easy down. to see them eating, maybe. Yes, yeah, there it goes. Good appetites. Yeah, and I was counting pears in here, and I was counting six of them in the roots. So they have laid the eggs, and yeah, they feel nice being inside there. <laughs> Well, there's, there's so many hiding spots for them. I think it's great. Yeah. And in the morning when I turn on the lights, it's four of them need three minutes. After 10 minutes, it's eight of them. And after yeah, 15 minutes, all 25 swims back and forward, waiting for food every morning. <laughs> So we could see about, it looks like one, two, three, four. It looks like I could see maybe 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and we know there's 25 in there. So there's 15 that are kind of hiding out right now. Yes. They're actually eating under that root. So there's yeah. a lot of them under there. Oh, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight under the roots. <laughs> okay. We can't see it's them. Oh, maybe a little bit to the left. I could see a little bit. They're, they're the most beautiful roots or, or driftwood. That, uh, where did you find those? Uh, I had to search and ask the importer who uh, uh, sell them for a local fish stores. He get them from Germany and they used three months taking care of every big root for me. And I got them sent over. So I had around five, six roots at this size. So it was directly imported to Norway, to my place. That's amazing. That, that, must have, that must be almost the largest things that you had shipped to you. Yeah, because local fish stores, they, they never take such things into the, the shops because customers need small things, right. not huge things, yeah. Not everybody has an 880 gallon tank in their living room. Maybe. <laughs> Everyone deserves it. That's right. That's the fact. Yeah. <laughs> no, it it's have also be a dream come true, building the house and yeah, just doing it. Lars, would you take us in the back and show us what's behind the scenes? Yeah, the secret room. <laughs> the secret room. We're going to get to see the secret room, guys. It's a little bit lovely here, but first, yeah. Should you, I can explain a little bit. I take care of two pairs. They are not shy. The breeding pairs usually are not shy. No. They love it when I come, sir. It means food. <laughs> uh, so this with the black hollow is a first generation of wild. So these are F1s and that looks like the female to the left and the male to yeah. the right, everyone. And the red one is a second generation. So I'm mixing first and second generation. Wow. And, and look at this. What's that? Catfish. <laughs> A catfish. <laughs> That's Leo. He always comes when the door is open. He wants to drink from the sun. <laughs> <laughs> He's beautiful. He's so big. Yes. So the, the male behind, uh, it's the second generation. And he is so solid, so beautiful in shape and color. So I just want to try to have solid offsprings, a bit more reddish, maybe. 
You're making your own greeting line. Yeah. Actually, oh, I have to ask you about, I'm, I'm, for the first time in all of our phone calls, I'm noticing that there's a pleco in your ble a breeding tank. Yes, they clean, they are my cleaners. <laughs> they're not going to eat the eggs or disturb the breeding pair? No, not at all. They just go on the bottom and eat leftovers. That is wonderful. I had no idea they would do Now, how, what kind of pleco is this and how big will it get? Uh, this is uh, the L066 is the number of it. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's perfect with uh, the water degree and everything. They live in Amazon. And I have a second breathing pair. And the behind is the male with the black color. Uh, he's first generation and her is second generation. Some the, kind of semi-royals, yeah. The female's in the back, yes? No, no, opposite. <laughs> opposite, so the, the male has the darker halo? Yes. Okay. So the plan is having them to breed this year. And I will take care of just 10 from those and 10 from those. Because this is the big challenge in the whole bit, breeding. Right. It's too many fish after a while. <laughs> Lars, I'm, I'm going to guess, and I know this only because you're my friend, but and you've told me this before, but I, I believe this is about a 75 gallon tank that you're breeding in. Uh, let's see, it's uh, those two is 60 gallon. 60, okay. And I have four of these, so it's 90 gallons. Okay, so two 60s and then four 90s? Yeah. Can we go back to the 60s for a second? I want, I, there's some very uh, interesting things here I'd like to point out to the viewers, but your tanks have black walls and a white bottom. Yes. And most of the breeders that we talk to say that they have to have breeding tanks all white so the fry can see the parents. Yes, but- You don't have that are, problem. No, not at all, because when you breed wilds, first generation, etc., they have too much instinct in them. Do you think it's wild wolves in the Amazon? No. <laughs> no. No. So, uh, and, and uh, the wild lines also produce more on the skin uh, where the, the price eat. Yeah. But if you have them, um, yeah. All the breeds for 20, 40 generation, the, the effect disappears. Do you think so it's possible to nature, what? Do you think Sorry? it's possible to breed domestics in a in a black tank like that and the fry would find the parents? Uh, not the pigeon. Um, because the fries don't find the parents. This is fascinating. But, yeah. It really is. Look at the colors. <laughs> I love the color. This is my favorite. The one on the right is my, my favorite kind yeah. of history. What is on the bottom of the tank? Is the bottom of the tank painted? Yeah, painted. Uh, if I, because this tank is from 2013, then I painted everything. Okay. If uh, I bought this new today, I would use, um, what do you call it? Uh, the vinyl? Um, yeah, vinyl, yes, not paint. And did you paint uh, the design? There's like a black on a black, shiny black no, and black. That's mess of water and the paint just goes away from the glass. So okay. it's accident. Yeah. Well, it looks nice though. Yeah, kind of artistic. <laughs> it is, it looks very artistic. Uh, Beautiful. So yes, we talk about water changes. Okay. Uh, do you see this one? Automatic water change. Yeah. And every six hours, the water goes from there to the sun, to the lift pump and into the aquariums. 
So this system has water change four times every day. Four water and changes a day at what percentage? Uh, all together, I flush in um, 920 gallons each day. Uh, per day? Yeah. Is that for everything, including the 880 and Lean's tank? Yes, everything. So almost a thousand gallons per day in water changes. Uh, no, that was too much. Uh, only uh, 100 all together in one day. 25 each six hour I flush in. Okay. In fresh water, yes. How many gallons total do you think everything is? Uh, you, you've got four 90s, you've got two 60s, Lean's uh, one, 160, and then your 880. Is that right? Is that everything? Yeah. Yes. That's, that's so that may have to do the math. <laughs> Sounds like uh, 12, 13, 1400 gallons. I'll do the math later, but this is great. So, Lars, yeah. that's your that's your wet dry. That's your sump over there for everything. Yes, everything is in this room. It's not a big room, but it's functional. It works. So. I have space enough to raise like 100 discus babies to be one year. And then you have to uh, split them up. Because too much fishes, the water gets too polluted. <laughs> so you have to make the balance. We can sit down after and talk a little bit about the water quality in Norway, the balance between the volume, the fishes, and what I use for everything. But do you see the corners? Yes. I got overflow in each tank. Okay. Yeah. And that looks, that looks like a, is that a sponge on the, uh, in front of the overflow? Yes, sponge, sponge outside the overflow. Okay. So like a matten filter. Yeah. And um, yeah, sorry about the camera. But the pipelines with water in? Yes. That's the end. And you see the return of the water, the tap pipeline. Okay. And that goes in the bottom of the sun. And, and everything in the room is going to the sump, including the 880, yes? Everything. Everything. So I have the filter act with both wet and dry filtration. We can talk about it when I sit down, if you remember to ask. Okay. So everything goes down into the most tiny sump in the world. It's not big. It's just the lift pump and the heaters. Wow. And the water goes up and also to the big tank. And this is the rack with the sumps for the big tank with wet and dry filtration. Uh, K1 media. Yeah, K1. And I also have a chemistry for polishing the water for the big tank. And I love being a plumber, but I am an artist, a musician, but doing all those things, it's so funny. That's so the top costs, of the eight, 880 gallon tank. That's the top of the big tank. Yeah, the top of it. What did you use for cover? Is that uh, polycarbonate? Yeah, it is. It's 10 millimeters, so it's strong enough. And yeah, it works for the lights and everything. Excellent. And you can see a little bit more of the constructions together with the glass. So it's solid. It's beautiful. And I got space for storage. Do you think people want to know what they feed the fishes with? Absolutely. Everybody would like to know what you feed them. Yeah. I see tropical. Yeah. It's one of them. Tropical flakes. <laughs> and tetra pellet. It's no, it's not pellets, it's flakes. Okay. Power flakes, yeah. <laughs> and I use this one. 
Okay. Yeah. That's your palettes. Very nice. Astacolor means uh, in the tropical formula, it means that there's astaxanthin in there, which is going to bring out the red colors in the fish. Yeah. And when you work it solid lines, it's, yeah, give a little extra. You know, like, and who, who are and these guys geos. right here? Here's your geos. Yeah. How many? Uh, it's 20 of them. 20 geos. But I will only have five of them in the big 880. But they have to cover up first. So I have this for seven weeks now. And they are more than twice the size in seven weeks. How much bigger will they get? Uh, they will be like uh, four to six inches. Okay. Like a discus, medium discus. And nice. complete red with these blue green lines. They, they are gorgeous, beautiful fishes. Even it's not discus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they're very beautiful fish. And they'll have no problem being with the, uh, with the discus. There's no competition there? No, not yet. I have, yeah, they hide. I have two of uh, the second generation just testing with the geos. And it works fine. It's not a problem so far. Okay. Uh, and it's a warm room and water. And I use this for taking uh, the wetness of the air inside. A uh, dehumidifier. Yeah. Okay. So it's good to have. Oh, yeah. And it's water out in the system. Uh, that's your drain? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I feel safe even some accidents happen. <laughs> uh, you have, you've thought of everything. You have drainage and everything. Yeah, it's, but this is the fun part of planning things. And um, have done things before. And um, you know the weight of it, the security of water, everything. It's beautiful. And, uh, yeah, two seconds. Oh, okay. it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, thank you. Lars, tell us a little bit about your filtration system and how you, how you set it up. Did you? I didn't notice any pads in there. Is there floss or pads to pick up the dirt? Uh, if you saw in the corner of the aquariums. Okay. That's, think of it like a pre-filter. Right. Pre filter yeah. And the water runs into the, the, yeah, let's call it the filter rack. It's divided sumps just in a rack. Right. Yeah, and it goes in directly to the, gem, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, the filtration, what they use, the yellow ones. Oh, the, the biomedia. Old. Yeah, biomedia, sorry. And it's in the wet chamber, water all over it. And then it goes to the top and drip down to K1. So you got a lot of air inside the water. Right. And then to sump. Yeah. And when I build a system, uh, we have like uh, 14,000 gallons altogether. But I build it four times as big, heavy, polluted with fishes. So it's, it's overkill filtration. And um, what I learned through these years about the hobby, it's all about the water, filtration, water change, and the fish, and what we do with the fish. Uh, I told you earlier, I got the wilds today, flight into Norway. You got four new wild fish today. Yeah, and it's the main reason is getting new blood into the lines of the breathing, the plants of breathing. Because I don't believe in inbreed, even in fishes. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I try to have pure good lines. And Rick told so much good information in your last interview. 
to Rick Gadway is a wealth of information and a good friend, yes. Yeah, and he's just like a book. You can put a penny on him and say one question and it goes. And when I listen to you two guys and he's talking about things, I felt so familiar. We do things differently, but the thinking about the fishes, the water quality, and it's about water, water, water all the time. Of course. Bad water, first week of breeding can, yeah, damage all the fishes. Lean, do you don't you don't use any K one media in your filtration, do you? Uh, no, I don't have any K one. I only have this um, cer ceramic bio yeah. bio media. Mm. Bio media. Do and some any, uh, air stones or is there anything aerating your water? No, uh, I have an air stone in the um, in the same chamber under the uh, bio media. Okay, but uh, not in the tank. Is if that was the question. Okay. In the tank, there's some the movement in the uh, water. Uh, the water also. looked very, very calm in the tank. It, I, I didn't see the yeah. plants moving very much at all, so it's very nice water. Mm. No, it's uh, mainly movement in the top of the water. Okay. And, mm. and, and all of your air is in the sump? Yeah. The sump. yeah. Mm. And, uh, so, Lars, you're... Your rack system is kind of like leans. Leans goes from uh, let's say right to left, so to speak. Yours is going yeah. from top to bottom. Yes. Okay. And and but the same principle. You're you're getting the the the, uh, the pads or the floss is going to be a top and just work its way down. Yeah. It. Uh, but I do one more thing. I do the same as you have in your system, but you do it first. The drip system. Yeah. I have that part through K1 in the last chamber for getting oxygen into the water as much as possible. And you have a different type of bacteria when it's air into it compared with just water and uh, biomedia. So you're trying to oxygenate the water at the very last step before it goes back into the tank? Yes, exactly. That makes sense. I think that's wonderful. That's so, uh, yeah. So, you know, I know you're into wild discus, but at some point in time, you're going to be at F5, 6, 7, 8. They are domestic at that point, are they not? They are already the first generation. <laughs> you know, wild animals, when we got them, you got them from Santorem. Uh, I get them from Germany, this one. Uh, you can see they are wild. It's, uh, they are more, what do you call it? It's, it's more in them. Yes. The fins are more bony, the head are more, it's- They are rougher. Actually. Rougher, yeah. Mm. Yes, and the, shape, and the shape too, Lean, the shape is very nice. Mm. Yeah, very, very nice. And as you saw over second generation, it's domestic. Mm. Because they breed and grow up in slow water, get feed all the time, nothing to be scared of. The fins are higher for each generation. And then you go this high body discus and everything. You, you have everything. But in nature, they fight for their lives, swim in big streams. They almost don't have fins at all, like one centimeter on the back. Interesting. It's, it's, so, I'm enjoying yeah. them very much. Yeah. So, uh, so you're right. After first generation, they are domestic. But still, even if they're not wild, I guess we we could say we are into the wild uh, look of them. The, yeah. the, the brown discus, for for me at least, I think the brown discus are the most beautiful fish. I, I do as well. I, I'm learning more and more about them. I love. I have. I have solid reds. I have uh, royal, semi-royal. I only have one heckle. Um, just trying to get familiar with them all. Um, but yeah. the brown, the brown are just striking. Uh, it's just an amazing fit. You know what else I noticed, Lean, is the thickness, the width of the fish in a wild fish is just so much more robust than the mm. domestic. They're so thin. Yes, that's true. Mm. Which just means that I guess in nature they're just going to need to be stronger, healthier, and and be able to fight more, right? 
Yeah, yes. Absolutely. So, but they have a good life in Norway, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they do. <laughs> I think so. I, I can't thank you guys enough for this. I mean, you, you've shared with me, you both have shared so much information with me and, and Lars, we've been on the, on the phone and talking about your tanks, even when you were building them. Um, but for mm -hmm. everybody, all the viewers, all the Discus Review members to see this, is, I think it's just gonna be amazing. They're gonna just fall out of their chairs. Everybody's gonna wanna do this. Thank you mm -hmm. so much to both of you for being an inspiration and for paving the way for all of us. This is our dream too. You just fulfilled it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for inviting us. Mm. And you I guess the, one of the reasons for saying yes to this is that we have seen the other interviews you have done and we really enjoy them. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, all the uh, information and all the knowledge and seeing how other people do this stuff. We have the same hobby, but, but there's so many different, way, different ways to, to have discus and aquarium. Yes. It's not only one way to do this. Mm. That's what I love about it. There is no one way to do it. There is no best way to do it. And uh, that, that was just, that's what it uh, attracted me to the hobby in the beginning. Mm. You can really make it your own. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And uh, you have collected the most nicest people in, in the group, all of them, every one of them. And so this is over goodbye to them <laughs> for tonight. Mm. But uh, we will be on and I will post and the, the wild fishes. I can't wait they, to see more and, and keeping us uh, up. I want to see babies. I want to see fry. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Me too. You have work to do. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, that's so nice. Thank you very much, Pete, for being a part Friends, Lars and Lean, thank you so much for inviting us into your home and showing us your beautiful tanks. Uh, on behalf of Discus Review, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>